All right, so, um, so now, uh, once again, let's get back to this, this problem. So now we have a primal problem, and we're adding a new constraint to the primal problem, which corresponds to adding a new variable to the dual problem. And just like we did so um, earlier, so let x star and w star uh, denote optimal solutions for the original primal pair, uh, primal dual pair of problems, okay? Optimal solutions of P and D respectively. Now let me ask you uh, this question basically. So what are the possibilities? So what are the possible situations that can happen between uh, the original primal problem and the new primal problem? So first of all, note that the uh, feasible region of the new primal problem cannot be larger than the feasible region of the previous problem, right? Because we're actually introducing one more constraint, okay? Um, so which means that if I look at the original primal optimal solution, which I denote by x star, then x star may or may not be feasible for the new problem, right? Okay? I know that x star satisfies all of these constraints. x star satisfies all of these constraints, but it may or may not satisfy this constraint, basically, right? Is that clear? Okay. So just like, uh, I mean, we had the same situation in the dual problem in the previous case, basically, right? So the previous optimal solution may or may not be optimal, basically, okay? Depending on whether the uh, previous optimal solution satisfies a new constraint or not. Um, let me try to illustrate by an example. So suppose that this is my primal problem. Okay, so feasible region of the primal problem. And let's assume that this is my optimal solution, okay? So this is the original primal problem and x star is the optimal solution, okay? So if I add a new constraint such as this one, for instance, so this is my new constraint given by dx is less than or equal to d bar, then my new feasible region actually will be given by this, okay, which is smaller than the previous one. And note that in that case, x star is still feasible, right, for the new constraint, okay? x star obviously satisfies all the previous constraints, but in addition, it satisfies a new constraint as well. And I claim that if that is the case, then x star is still optimal, okay? So can somebody give me why that's the case? So why is it true that I cannot find a better solution than x star? Well, here's one way to think about this. Well, obviously the red feasible region is smaller than the, the black feasible region, right? And in the larger feasible region, x star was the best solution. Then in the smaller region, obviously x star should still be the best solution, okay? So here's one way to think about it, another way to think about it. So um, let's say, you know, what's the highest mountain in Turkey? Exactly. So what's the highest mountain in Aure? Still the same, basically, right? So I'm actually in a new constraint, but the optimal solution does not change, okay? Um, what is the other possibility? Well, so once again, let's go back to the same question. So what's the highest mountain in Turkey? Well, that's the, the you know, um, our mountain, let's say. Uh, what's the highest mountain in, in Ankara, let's say, okay? So now, um, you know, the mountain Aro will not even be a feasible solution for my problem, okay? So as a result, the optimal solution will change, and that's precisely the second case. Um, <coughs> So in this case, x star is still optimal. But on the other hand, if my feasible region is, again, such as this one, but my new constraint looks like, for instance, this one right here, okay? Now the new feasible region will be given by this red area, basically. And in this case, x star will not even be feasible for my problem, right? Okay? And depending on, on what your C vector is, for example, maybe this will be your new optimal solution. So as a result, there are, there are two possibilities. So if the previous optimal solution satisfies a new constraint, then it's still optimal, okay? If it does not satisfy a new constraint, then the optimal solution will change, basically, okay? Um, Now let me look at it from the dual perspective, the perspective of the dual problem. So W star is an optimal solution for the dual problem, let's say, original dual problem. Now, based on W star, can I construct a feasible solution for the new dual problem? 
so I know a feasible solution for this problem and based on that can I construct a new feasible solution for the new dual problem? Yes. How am I going to do that? Exactly, so I'll just, just like we did in the pri primal problem in the first case, so I'm going to simply define W bar to be zero and I'll just use W star so that will give me a feasible solution for the dual problem basically, okay? Um, and the objective function value will still be the same as the objective function value of the previous problem. Right? Because I will still have W star B and I'm going to define W bar to be zero. So as a result, that solution may or may not be optimal for the dual problem. Okay? And just like using a similar uh, sort of argument as before, if the original primal solution satisfies a new constraint, then the old dual solution will still be optimal for this problem. If the old optimal solution does not satisfy the new constraints, then the optimal solution to this problem will change, basically, okay? So that's exactly the sort of corresponding, corresponding argument, basically. So as a result, um, so let's say that um, W double star, which I'm going to define it by W star followed by zero, so this is the value of W bar, is feasible for the new dual problem. Um, if x star is still feasible for the new problem, feasible for the new primal problem for p prime, um, then x star is optimal for p prime and w double star is optimal for the new dual problem since uh, why, why is that? Because Cx star will just be the same as W star B in that case, okay? So I have a pair of feasible solutions, their objective function values are the same, so as a result uh, they will be optimal for the new problem. And if this is not the case, then we're going to be in the situation of the second example over there, then X star will not be feasible, so the optimal solution will change in that case, okay? So let me again go back to the example. Um, let me go back to this example. Okay, so I'll give you one more minute, so just. So if x star is still feasible for p prime, then x star is optimal for p prime. And w double star, which is defined in this way, by simply defining the new variable to, setting new variable to zero, setting new dual variable to zero, will be optimal solution for the corresponding dual problem. And this follows from strong duality, so the objective function values will be the same, okay? So now can I go back to the previous example? Thank you. Um, so still I'm looking at the same example. So I'm going to ask myself the following question. So what happens if we add a new constraint given by x1 plus x3 is greater or equal to 9. So now I have this problem and in addition I'm actually introducing a new constraint. So my boss tells me that you know the sum of production of the first and third units should be at least 9 for instance, okay? So I'm interested in the following question. So will my previous optimal uh, production plan still be optimal for the new problem as well, okay? All right, so how can we determine whether the optimal solution will stay the same or not? Um, so I will just take the optimal solution of this problem and I will plug it into this constraint and see whether it's satisfied or not. Okay, so to do that I need to first of all figure out what my optimal solution is. So what is my x star for this problem? Well, the first component which is given by x1 is equal to 2 basically. Okay, what is the second component? What is x2? the value of x2? Zero. zero because it's non-basic. What about x3? It's going to be 8. x4 will be 24. x5 will be 0 and x6 will be 0 basically, right? So these three are basic and the other three are non-basic so this is the optimal solution. So I will just plug, it, plug this solution into this constraint, okay? So will x star satisfy the new constraint? Well, what's the first component? I have 2. And what's the second component? 
sorry, third component, 8. So this is equal to 9, and 9 is indeed greater than or equal to 9. So this implies that x star is still optimal for the new problem. Does everyone see that? So all I'm doing is I'm just sort of plugging in the optimal solution to the new constraint and see whether it's satisfied or not. Okay? So this is exactly this situation right here, basically. Okay? All right, so any questions about this? So this wasn't too hard. So let's say in part two, what if we add um, So what if we add the following constraint? What if we add x1 plus x3 is less than or equal to 9? So what happens if I add this new constraint now? Well, so again, I'm going to just do the same check. So does my previous optimal solution satisfy the new constraint? No. So the answer is no. Why is that? Because in this case, x1 star plus x3 star which I computed already, is equal to 10. And 10 is not less than or equal to 9, basically, okay? So this implies that x star cannot be optimal. Cannot be optimal anymore. Well, so what are we going to do? Okay, I'm interested in finding the new optimal solution. Um, So how should I proceed? Well, of course, one way of doing it is the following. So I'll take this constraint, add it to my problem, and solve the problem from the beginning. Okay? But I claim that there's a smarter way of doing that. Okay? So if I do it just like the way I described, then I'm not using any information from the original problem, basically. Okay? So the whole idea of sensitivity analysis is basically to use the information from the previous problem. Okay? So as a result, how can I use the information from the original problem? Well, here's one way to think about this. So this is going to be the fourth constraint, basically, right? So which means that it will correspond to a fourth row in the simplex tableau. Okay? So which means that I'm going to actually need one more basic variable. So number of basic variables was three. So now I'm going to need a fourth basic variable. Is that clear? Okay. So first of all, what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to add a slack variable to turn it into equality constraint. So as a result, I'm going to have x1 plus x3 plus x7 is equal to 9. OK? So then I'm going to go back to my tableau. And I'm going to add a new column for x7, the new slack variable. And the right-hand side values are still the same, 280, uh, 24, 8, and 2. All right, so now please pay attention carefully because this is important. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation and just sort of insert it in the simplex tableau. Okay? So I'm going to have 0 here. Then for x1, I'll have 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. I'm going to have 1, and the right-hand side will be 9. Okay? So I'm just taking this equation and adding it as is to the simplex tableau for now. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to use x7 as my basic variable. Okay, so as a result, the new basic variable for the new row will be x7. Okay? All right, so what I need to do is the following. I need to, first of all, figure out what these entries are. Okay? And then I can continue with the simplex method. Okay? So now let's think about this a little bit. So what are the entries here for x7? Well, what exactly is x7? x7 is nothing but a select variable, basically, right? for my fourth constraint, okay? So which means that if I look at the column of x7 in my problem, I'm going to have 0, 0, 0, followed by a 1, basically, right? Okay? So which means that the first three columns will be equal to zeros, okay? 
And remember, these entries were, were nothing but B inverse times the column of uh, that variable. Okay, so I'm going to multiply the original B inverse by 0, 0, 0 here, basically, right? Okay, so what's the multiplication of B inverse with 0, 0, 0? Obviously, I'm going to have 0, 0, 0. So as a result, um, um, the entries underneath X7 for the first three constraints will still be zeros. Okay, I also need to compute the row of zero coefficient of X7. So, um, what is the expression that I'm going to use? Well, I need CB times B inverse times A7 minus C7, right? I'm still using the original problems B inverse, though. Okay? So, for now, just pretend that this uh, row does not exist. Well, once again, A7 is 0, 0, 0, basically, for the first three constraints. Okay? So, as a result, this is going to be 0. C7 is also 0 because X7 is a slight variable. So, the difference, again, will be equal to 0. Okay? So, as a result, I will also have zero here. Is that clear? So, okay. So all I'm doing is I'm just pretending that you know x7 was here with the new uh, column zero 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 and the cost coefficient zero. In that case, everything is still zeros basically. Okay, underneath x7. All right. So now I want to continue, but there's one thing you should be careful about. This is really important. In order to uh, continue with the simplex method, I need to make sure that my tableau is in proper form. So if you recall, so we had this problem when we used the two-phase method as well, right? Or the big M method as well, okay? So to start the simplex method or to continue with simplex method, we need to make sure that, for example, if x1 is a basic variable in row three, then only this component should be one and everything else should be zeros, okay? However, that's not the case here, okay? Similarly, for instance, x3 is a basic variable, but I should only have one, have one here, whereas there's also one over here as well. So as a result, my first task is to put the, uh, the tableau in the proper form, okay, so that I can continue with the simplex. So in particular, I need to get rid of this number. Okay? I also need to get rid of this number here. And for the other variables, I think everything else is fine. Okay? This, this is fine. This is also fine. But there are problems here and here, basically. Okay? So I need to fix that before I can continue. So how am I going to fix this? Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just take row of 3, multiply it by minus 1, and add it to row of 4, basically. If I do that, then this number will be 0. Okay? Just like we zero out in the usual simplex method, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to zero out this term. So essentially, I'm going to take row of 3, multiply it by minus 1, and add it to row of 0, add it to row of 4, sorry. Then I'm going to take row of 2, multiply it by minus 1, and add it to row of 4 again. Is that clear? So this is really, really important, so I just want to make sure that... This is understood. So does everyone see what the problem is right now? Yes. Okay. So we need to fix that problem, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So essentially, I'm going to try to zero out both of these two terms. Okay. And if you zero out those two terms, you're going to have the following new numbers. So you're going to have 0, 3 over 4. Well, this part is still 0. Um, 0, 0, minus 3 over 2, 5 over 2, 1, and now the right hand side actually becomes minus one. Okay, so all of these numbers will change by the red counterparts basically. Well, the right hand side value of x7 is minus one. Okay, that's not good, right? Okay. But I claim that that shouldn't be surprising either. Why not? Because in my current solution, the value of x7 is indeed equal to minus 1, basically, right? Because x1 is equal to 2, x3 is equal to 8, 2 plus 8 minus 1 is exactly equal to 9. Okay? So as a result, um, we have a solution, which is a basic solution, but this solution is not feasible for the primal problem. Okay? However, if you look at the, uh, the row of zero coefficients, then everything is still non-negative. Okay? So which means that the dual feasibility is still maintained, basically, right? Okay? And in particular, my new dual variables will be 0, 10, 10, and 0 for the new variable. And the new variable is precisely w bar. Okay? So which is exactly that solution that I'm using before. Okay? So how are we going to continue then? We have dual feasibility, but primal infeasibility. Dual exactly. So I'm going to just apply dual simplex. Okay? Now, in the previous case, when we added a new variable to the primal problem, if we lose dual feasibility, then we continue with primal simplex. In the new situation, we actually we may lose uh, primal feasibility, then we apply dual simplex. Okay, so uh, everything is symmetric basically in primal and dual problems. Okay, all right. So how are we going to continue? Well, 
I'm going to try to force this out of the basis, basically. Okay. And what would be the new pivots? Well, remember, so I just look at the row corresponding to uh, that negative number, and I'll look for negative entries. In this case, there's only one. So as a result, I'm going to pivot now on this number. So as a result, I'm, I'm going to make x5 a basic variable, and x7 will be non-basic, and I'm going to continue, which I'm not going to do, but that's how we should continue, basically. Okay? Any questions? Is that clear? So, I mean, please remember to turn the tableau in proper form before you can continue. Okay? And just as a hint, I mean, the problem is that if you try to continue with the original version, then, then what you're doing will, will be just garbage, basically, okay? So it will not mean anything at all, okay? And one way to remember that, that uh, the right-hand side should be negative is because you're actually violating the new constraint. So you should have a negative number on the right-hand side, okay? Because otherwise, I mean, the solution is already feasible, right? So there's nothing to worry about, okay? Questions again? All right, so let me do one more example. All right, so what happens if we add the following constraint? What if we add x1 plus x3 is greater than or equal to 11? Well, is my previous solution still optimal? So, x1 plus x3 is equal to 10, and 10 is not greater than 11, basically, okay? So, as a result, uh, so x1 star plus x3 star, which is equal to 2 plus 8, 10, and 10 is not greater than or equal to 11. So, which means that x star cannot be optimal, cannot remain optimal. So what are we going to do? Well, once again, I mean, the first stage is to turn it into equality constraints, okay? So I have a greater than or equal to constraint, so I need an excess variable, basically, right? So I need to subtract an excess variable. So x1 plus x3 minus x7 will be equal to 11. Okay? So what I want to do is the following. Just like in this example, I want to use x7 as my new basic variable, okay? But the problem is that x7 has a negative coefficient here, okay? In this case, we were fine because x7 had a positive coefficient and we had 1, 0, 0, 0 um, as desired. But now we have minus 1, so how can I get rid of that? Exactly. I'm going to just multiply by minus 1. Well, the right-hand side becomes negative. I don't care because the right-hand side will be negative anyways, okay? So as a result, I'm going to multiply by minus 1 and I'm going to obtain this new equation. Okay, minus x1 minus x3 plus x7 is equal to minus 11. So now I'm going to continue with the simplex again. So first of all, I'll just copy that equation. So x7 is the basic variable here, okay? So I'm going to have minus 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and the right-hand side is minus 11. Well, so let me check my basic variables. X1 is basic, but there's a non-zero entry here. And X3 is basic, and there's a non-zero entry here. So I need to get rid of these two terms, okay, before I can start. So to do that, I'll just take row 3 and add to row 4, and I'll take row 2 and add to row 4, so that both of these entries will be zeros, okay? And note that everything else here is the same, okay? Just like in the previous case. So if you just uh, put the tableau in proper form, you have the following, you have 0, 0, minus 3 over 4, this becomes 0, and 0, then 3 over 2, um, minus 5 over 2, then this is 1, and the right-hand side is, again, minus 1. And once again, that minus 1 should not surprise you, because if I plug in the current solution, 2, minus 2, minus 8, which is equal to minus 10, minus 1 is equal to minus 11, basically, okay? So, indeed, the value of x7 should be equal to minus 1 in the solution. 
All right, so what am I going to do? Well, we have again dual feasibility, but primal infeasibility. So I'm going to apply dual simplex. So I'm going to try to force this variable out of the basis. Then what am I going to replace it with? Well, you just need to perform minimum ratio for this column and this column, basically. What's the ratio for this one? So 5 divided by the absolute value of minus 3 over 4 is 20 over 3. And what about this one? Sorry, this one. 10 divided by minus 5 over 2. <coughs> so you get 4, basically, right? So which one is smaller? Obviously, this one is smaller. So as a result, I'm going to pivot on this entry. So that x6 will now replace x7, and we'll continue with the dual simplex, OK? <coughs> is that clear? So, so I, mean, I mean, intuitively, again, this should make perfect sense, because essentially, uh, when I add a new constraint to my primal problem, the only possible change can be losing primal feasibility, basically, okay? And if I lose primal feasibility, since I still have dual feasibility, because I can construct a dual feasible solution for a new problem, then I will just apply dual simplex to restore primal feasibility again, okay? All right, so finally, this is part three, and this is a bit tricky, basically. So what if we add the following constraints? So what if we add x1 plus x3 is exactly equal to 11. So we know how we can handle a less than or equal to constraint. We know how we can handle a greater than or equal to constraint. But what if we add an equality constraint now, OK? So how do we handle that? Well, if you think about this a little bit, as I said, so now this is going to be our fourth constraint. So which means that we're going to have a fourth row in the simplex tableau, which means that we need a fourth basic variable, right? Now, in the first two cases, that basic variable was easy to find because here we just use the slack variable. Here we just use the excess variable after multiplying by minus 1, basically, okay? The problem here is that, of course, there's no slack or excess variable in this case, okay? So the question is, what are we going to do? OK. <clears throat> so that would be one way of doing it. So essentially, what uh, your friend is suggesting is the following. So I'm going to add a, an artificial variable. OK. For example, x7 will be an artificial variable. Um, and then the coefficient of x7 will be minus m in the objective function. OK. So I'm going to try to compute the new solution by using the big M method, basically, for the new problem. OK. So that would be one way of doing it. OK. Um, however, there's a, another way of doing it without using the big M method. So, um, and I'm going to uh, try to sort of figure out what that is. Well, remember, so um, we have seen this before. Equality constraints can be thought of inequality constraints, basically, right? So how can I replace an equality constraint by inequality constraints? And less than or equal to, right? So, so x1 plus x3 equals 11, if and only if x1 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11, and x1 plus x3 is greater than or equal to 11. OK? Now, what's the point of doing this? Well, instead of adding this constraint, I'm going to add first this constraint, and then this constraint to my problem. OK? And for this one, I'll just use the stack variable as my new basic variable. For this one, I'm going to use the excess variable as my new basic variable. And as a result, by doing that, I can use, well, I'm going to do twice as work, twice as much work, because I'm adding two constraints. But I'm not going to need any artificial variables, basically, OK? So that's the nice part about it, OK? So we're going to add each inequality constraint one by one. Of course, I mean, one thing you should be careful about is the following. So first, I'm going to add, for example, x1 plus x3 less than or equal to 11, and then find the optimal solution. After that, I'm going to add x1 plus x3 greater than or equal to 11, and again, find the new optimal solution. So I'm going to actually um, do both of them twice, OK, in some sense, OK?
two constants can we add x7 minus x8 to first one? You mean for this one? No. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to have minus. X7 minus X8. Okay. Does it work? Well, what I mean, so as I said, there are two ways of doing this. So the first one is that you can just define an artificial variable, a single artificial variable, such as X7, for instance. But then you need to add the appropriate cost coefficient to the objective function, okay? So the cost coefficient of x7 will be minus m, for example, in this case, okay? <clears throat> so that will be one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is the following. So rather than working with artificial variables, you can replace this constraint by a less than or equal to and a greater than or equal to constraint, and then you can add each one one by one. So that's what I'm saying, okay? So um, for some reason, I just find this easier than the first one, okay? So because, I mean, uh, students are, are sort of less likely to make a mistake when, when they do it that way, okay? But as I said, I mean, you're gonna do twice as much work, so that's the, um, that's the trade-off, basically, okay? Other questions? Is the last part clear again? So, so equality constraints can be replaced by two inequality constraints, and then you can add each one of them one by one and continue, basically, okay? All right, so that brings us to the summary, finally. So I'm going to assume that the primal is a maximization problem and the dual will be a minimization problem, okay? So we know that these roles are symmetric, so um, they can be interchanged basically. So I'm going to give you the whole summary of sensitivity analysis. So I'm going to start with the change in the problem. Then I'm going to look at the effect of such a change. Then I'm going to say current basis optimal remains optimal if if a certain condition is satisfied and finally if the current basis is not optimal then I'm going to tell you what to do so let me start with the first change suppose that the, the right hand side of the i constraint is is replaced by something else, okay? So bi is replaced by bi bar. And let me just go back to the simplex tableau. So what part of the tableau will be affected by such a change? Only the right-hand side, basically, okay? So the effect will be primal feasibility on the right-hand side. <clears throat> so when does the current basis remain optimal? for such a change. So I'm changing little b. That only affects the right-hand side values. And I'm going to remain optimal if and only if the right-hand side values for the new b vector are still non-negative, basically, right? Okay? So which means that b inverse times the new b vector has to be greater than or equal to zero. And if the current basis is not optimal, that means that there's at least one negative component in the right-hand side, then what do I do? Then I apply dual simplex, exactly. So, okay, so this, this was the first type of change that we have seen. So then we looked at changes in the cost coefficient of variables. So first of all, let me start with a non-basic variable. So if I change the uh, cost coefficient of a non-basic variable, then what's the effect of such change on this tableau? So remember, we actually sort of looked at changes in C in two parts. Change in the cost coefficient of a non-basic variable and change in the cost coefficient of a basic variable, right? And in the second one, we said that CB changes. In the first one, CB stays the same, okay? So what's the effect of such a change? Well, it may affect dual feasibility, B 
because only Rov zero coefficients will change. And in particular, which Rov zero coefficients will change in this case? Well, in this case, only the Rov zero coefficient of xj will change, basically, okay? So we have seen this before, okay? If you look at your notes, you're going to see that that's the case. So <clears throat> only the Rov zero coefficient of of xj will change. So when does the current basis remain optimal for such a change? Well, as long as the Rho zero coefficient of xj is not negative, then we'll still be optimal. So what is the Rho zero coefficient of xj? So it's going to be cb times b inverse times aj, right? The j comma of a minus c bar j now, right? So as long as this is not negative, so this is the new Rho zero coefficient, then it's going to be optimal. Well, if this condition is not satisfied, then that means that the new Rho zero coefficient of xj will be negative. Then what am I going to do? Exactly. So now I'm going to apply primal simplex. So in particular, I'm going to enter xj and continue. So let's look at the other case. Suppose that cj is replaced by cj bar, but let's assume that xj is basic. <coughs> so what's the effect of such a change? Well, in this case, cb will change, right? And if cb changes, then the entire row zero along with right-hand side value will change, basically, right? So this affects dual feasibility. and also affects the entire row zero. So current, base remains, current basis remains optimal if under what conditions? Well, if the new row zero coefficients are all non-negative, basically. Okay. And so I'm going to use my new CB, so CB bar, B inverse times A minus C bar. So as long as this is not negative, then current basis remains optimal. So note that between the two, here I'm using the same CB, here I'm using this new CB bar, right? Okay? So why is that? Because CB did not change here, but it did change here in the second case. Okay? And if this condition is not satisfied, then what do I do? So that means that there's a negative row zero coefficient, basically. So I'm going to apply primal simplex. Okay? All right, so then we have seen the following. So a column of a non-basic variable may change. So I'm going to assume that xk is non-basic. So what's the effect of such a change? So remember, in this case, my B matrix will not change, okay? So as a result, this part is the same, this part is the same. The only thing that will change uh, will actually sort of take place in the k column of A, basically, okay? So which means that B inverse times AK will change, but B inverse AK is precisely the entries underneath XK in the simplex tableau. And based on that, the row zero coefficient of XK will also change, okay? So as a result, uh, <coughs> in this case, we may lose dual feasibility. Um, and the only effect will be the row zero coefficient of xk plus the entries underneath xk in the simplex tableau. So by the entries underneath, I'm actually talking about the entries corresponding to rows, okay? <coughs> so when does the current basis remain optimal? Well, as long as the new Rho zero coefficient of xk is non-negative, right? So what is the Rho zero coefficient of xk? B inverse, ak, ak bar, actually, minus ck. So as long as this is not negative, then we will still be optimal. 
And if this condition is not satisfied, what does that mean? So, so that means that there's a negative row zero coefficient, so I need to continue with which type of simplex? Primal simplex, exactly so. I'm going to continue from here, so I have the, uh, well, I have the same columns basically, which I'm not going to write. So suppose that AK is replaced by AK bar, but this time XK is a basic variable. So what happens if we change the column of a basic variable? So remember, this was the tricky situation basically. So we may have some complications because now we are actually changing the B matrix, right? Exactly. So since we're changing the B matrix, then the entire tableau depends on the B matrix. So everything changes basically. Okay. The entire tableau will change. So we're going to have the current basis remains optimal if and only if we still maintain primal and dual feasibility at the same time. Okay. So which means that if CB times B bar inverse a bar minus C should be non-negative, and B bar inverse B should be non-negative. So if it happens that for the new basis matrix, I still have non-negative right-hand side values and non-negative row zero coefficients, then I will still be optimal. And if this is not the case, then remember, so we don't apply primordial simplex, but we just solve it from the beginning, okay? So just solve it, solve the new LP from the beginning. Okay, so what else did we do? Well, what happens if I add a new variable? Xm plus 1 to the primal problem. Um, so what happens if I add a new variable? So that means I'm adding a new column to my simplex tableau. Okay, uh, but the right-hand side values do not change basically, right? Okay, so the only possible change or the only possible effect may be on dual feasibility because I'm going to uh, compute the row zero coefficient of my new variable. So the effect will be on dual feasibility. Now when does the current solution remain optimal? Well, after adding a new column, as long as the new row zero coefficient of that column is not negative, then I'm going to be optimal. And what's the row zero coefficient of the new variable? So I have CB times B inverse times, somebody help me, am plus 1 minus cm plus 1. So as long as this is non-negative, then that means that the row zero coefficient of xm plus 1 will be non-negative, which means that the current solution will still be optimal. So remember, this was the same as dual feasibility, basically, right? The variable, uh, the previous dual solution satisfying new dual constraint, basically, okay? Um, if that's not true, then what happens? What do we do? So we have a negative row zero coefficient. So we will just apply primal simplex. And finally, so what happens if we add a new constraint to the primal problem? Well, if we add a new constraint, then we are adding a new row to the simplex tableau, then row zero coefficients are not affected, okay? The only potential change will be on the right-hand side values. So as a result, we may only um, affect primal feasibility. So when does the current solution remain optimal? So this was the last example that we did. Well, as long as the previous optimal solution satisfies new constraint, basically. Okay, so if the previous optimal solution solution satisfies a new constraint, uh, 
And what happens if the previous optimal solution does not satisfy the new constraint? So then that means that we have a negative right-hand side value. So we're going to apply dual simplex. to restore primal feasibility, OK? And I think that's about it. So essentially, in this table, you have the sort of whole summary of sensitivity analysis, OK? So what happens if you change the right-hand side value? What happens if you change the cost coefficient of a basic variable, non-basic variable? What happens if you change the column of a basic variable, non-basic variable? And finally, what happens if you have a new variable or a new constraint? So everything is here. And as I said, I mean, when you sort of think about problems concerning sensitivity analysis, you should always keep that simplex tableau in mind, okay? So that will always help you because essentially that will tell you what parts of the tableau will be affected by such a change. And depending on that effect, whether the primal feasibility or dual feasibility may be lost, okay? And depending on which one is lost, that will tell you what, which type of simplex method you will apply, basically. Okay? Is that clear? So, all right, so I'll see you on Thursday.